of flows and also a knot of representations. Um, so uh, the first two are kind of easy, so let me start with the easy stuff. And so let me just say a little about uh, knot of diffeomorphisms. Places where the chalk is actually bigger than the chalk on it. Makes it more exciting. Okay, so this is all very classical and uh, well known. It's an excellent reason to talk about it. And so, <clears throat> let me just set off. So, uh, the notation will be the following I'll let uh, F be a diffeomorphism on a compact manifold. So, let's say it's uh, C infinity. Infinity, uh, diffeomorphism, and M is just going to be a closed manifold, so it's going to be compact and all the nice things. That was a bad piece. And I will maybe resort to using something else. And so everybody knows what the <coughs> definition is <coughs> of an Anosov diffeomorphism, which is why I'm going to give it. And so here we go. So I want to assume that uh, F is a Nossoff, which simply means that, um, first of all, there's a splitting of the tangent space. So there's a DF <coughs> derivative invariant continuous splitting of the tangent bundle into stable and unstable bits. And moreover, there are some constants here maybe, uh, C and lambda, which are positive, with the property that in the stable direction it contracts, and in the unstable direction uh, it doesn't. So D, uh, F to the N are restricted to ES, and it's going to go down in the opposite direction, DF to the minus N, E unstable. It's going to go down like C lambda to the N, and than equal to zero. So the reason I put a one here is because the second assumption is going to be that uh, f is transitive. I resist against all this. Is lambda maybe less than one? Lambda is indeed going to be smaller than one. Thank you very much. And um, in this case, we can introduce our, our first uh, the zeta function. So this is the alternate zeta function. <coughs> Some letters even look like they're English. That's amazing. And um, <coughs> it's as follows. So zeta of z. So z is just a... Uh, complex variable, so this is just defined to be <coughs> formally uh, the exponential <coughs> of the summation n equals 1 to infinity of uh, z to the n <coughs> over n, and then we put in something about the Anosov diffeomorphism, like uh, the number of uh, fixed points for f to the n. That's a perfectly decent uh, complex function, the variable z. And if one factorizes this in some way, it might turn out that it's something like the following. Uh, it's a product over orbits, uh, x, f of x, f, n minus 1 of x, of something like 1 minus uh, z to the p, this <coughs> is z, uh, plus z to minus 1. And here this will be over uh, primitive orbits, or maybe I'll just call them prime orbits. And it's all but not points. <coughs> what's P in this form? Sorry? Is it in this last line? Uh, what's P? Uh, good point. P is going to be period. Let's call that one P. Thank you very much. <coughs> yeah. P equals period of 
Okay, so it's just a different way of writing exactly the same complex uh, function. And like all formal uh, expressions, it's kind of useful if it converges somewhere. And so this guy uh, converges um, for the absolute value of uh, z being smaller than uh, exponential minus h of f, some function. And of course, this function here is just going to be the topological entropy. And secondly, well, we know it converges in some particular region, or certain radius. But in fact, it extends to the entire complex plane with a whole of value e to the minus h uh, of f. And so it extends uh, neuromorphically. C, in fact, as a <coughs> rational function. And it has a simple pole, whoops, with a simple pole at uh, z is equal to e to the minus uh, h of f. Last week I was in uh, Warsaw, so I have to avoid saying simple pole when working there. Um, so this result is, uh, well, in the case of a Nossoff diffeomorphism, it's due to Kuppenheimer. There's no, I have to check the spelling. Kuppenheimer. Uh, and the more general result was uh, due to uh, Manning, whose name I have to mention because he's a colleague of mine and he was a uh, key supervisor. And you are missing something. Thank you very much. I love all this participation. That's when it helps me. Okay, so, so this is all very classical and it's all very well uh, known. Um, let me just make a remark then. Uh, more exotic uh, would be to uh, weight the orbits in some way. So you can get more general zeta functions, such as uh, this guy. So I can take exactly the same expression, more or less, exponential summation n equals n to infinity, uh, z to the n of n. But instead of just counting the orbits by their existence, we put some weight in there. And so <clears throat> a popular one might be, uh, we look at all the points fixed under this guy, and then we might put 1 over uh, the determinant of uh, t, uh, whoops, d of x, <coughs> f to the n, minus the identity. And then that would be a kind of more general weighted uh, uh, zeta function. <coughs> so, weighted. Maybe it's kind of more spectral in some way. And one of the reasons I, I mention this is that, well, of course, if you have different anosov diffeomorphisms, you take one anosov diffeomorphism, change it a bit, and then by structural stability, the zeta function isn't going to change, but in this case, this guy does. And if you take some simple examples, such as um, the following, so if you take um, <coughs> a simple anosov diffeomorphism given by Z W goes to, very simple, z plus lambda over 1 plus lambda bar z. It's going to be a complex conjugate. Times uh, z w, I'll explain this in a minute, uh, z plus lambda over 1 plus lambda bar z. Put the brackets in the wrong place. And then it's going to be another w. So here I'm writing the, the, uh, the torus where T1 is just going to be the unit circle in the complex plane. And here, lambda is going to be a complex number whose absolute value is smaller than 1. And if I take lambda to be equal to uh, 0, then it, it, I get the Arnold cat map, hopefully. Arnold.
And in the case of the on account map, then the zeta function is rather like this one, give or take scaling by e to the minus f. Um, but in this case, um, for these examples, uh, the, the poles uh, for this zeta function, uh, let me give it a name, let me put uh, something there. So the poles for this zeta function uh, follow from uh, work of, it's coming to right here, so uh, yes. And I think I'm not allowed to write just Julia. I have to spell it correctly. So to write me this wrong, that would be useful. Uh, how about S L I P A N T uh, S C H U K? Close? No. Okay. <laughs> so this is another explicit zeta function, but instead of having just a finite number of poles and zeros, it's got an awful lot of them, and uh, they correspond to the uh, the values of lambda in a more exotic way. So. Perhaps <clears throat> the poles include uh, one and the values uh, lambda. I have to go uh, out, so it's going to be lambda to the minus m and lambda conjugate to the minus m, where m is going to be greater than equal to one. Something like that. That's the word perhaps in there because. There's always a room for error in these things. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about a Nossoff Um But thus motivated, uh, we can talk a bit about a Nossoff flows. And so here we go. <coughs> and we're still in the world of uh, classical, well known results. And so it's very similar again. So instead of a diffeomorphism, we have a flow. So let phi of t from n to n be a, a c infinity a flow. On a manifold. Closed manifold. And then we need a definition. It's going to be the usual definition. So phi is uh, not off. It, it satisfies <coughs> the following. And again, there's a splitting, but this time into three bundles. Uh, so or there is a d phi t. So the tangent space this time around is going to be having this extra bundle. And that is going to be a constant. And uh, this time maybe I'll get it right. And so 0 is smaller than 1 is smaller than 1. I'm going to raise lambda to the power t. And there exists. So here uh, E0 is one dimensional. Tangent to the flow. And the other bundles do nice things. So the flowing forward in time restricted to the stable bundle, it goes down like C lambda uh, to the T. And uh, D by minus T restricted to the unstable bundle does the same. And this is the T uh, positive. And again, I'm going to assume that the flow is transitive. So um, phi is transitive. So this is for a dental bit. <coughs> Why do I assume it's transitive? Well, mainly because if I don't assume it's transitive, then I don't know that this pole is simple. It might be multiple, that's the main reason for it. Otherwise, you could just decompose the flow of this, I guess. Okay, so I'm interested now in uh, Nossoff flows. So, what do I want to say about them? Well, I could give you the definition of the uh, zeta function, which would be a good thing to do. Uh, but before I do that, let me give a equally well-known example, which is just going to be the geodesic flow. 
in the context of uh, surfaces of constant negative curvature. <coughs> For some reason. An equally classical result, uh, example is the following, so classical example. Constant curvature. <coughs> this is mainly to introduce some notation. And so I assume that uh, I let uh, G just denote uh, SL uh, two R, possibly PSL two R even PSL two R, which looks not unlike uh, SL two R. Possibly quotienting out by plus or minus the identity. Like that. And then uh, I'll take uh, a discrete group inside here. So this is going to be a discrete uh, Fuchsian <coughs> group. And I'll assume that the, the quotient is uh, compact. So M is equal to uh, G quotient. So Gamma is compact. <coughs> so being British, I quotient out on the right by groups. I'm sure in France, I'd probably do it on the left. In Switzerland, I have no idea what you do. <laughs> so uh, phi of t is just going to be uh, the geodesic flow. And so this is just given by flowing on an element of uh, M. So it's a coset. So if I have, an, I have a G times a gamma, this is an element of big G then I just multiply it by some matrix uh, to get another element. And the matrix may be e to the, t over two, e to the minus t over 2, 0, 0. I'm frequently tempted to put e to the t, but uh, heck, let me try and be a little more consistent. So <clears throat> this is just a simple example of what is the Anosov flow. So the Anosov flow is just some flow, which has a, the merits it only has counted in many closed orbits, and then we can define a, a zeta function. So I'll use the definition due to Ruel, or alternatively, one could use the Selberg formulation, but I won't for the moment. And so I'm going to take s to be a complex number, and then I formally define the, the zeta function. Well, it's a complex variable, a complex function in my variable s, and it's given by an infinite product uh, over something, gammas, um, of 1 minus e to, whoops, e to the minus s l of gamma uh, to the minus 1. And here, gamma is simply closed orbits. So where uh, gamma is a closed orbit, it's a primitive closed orbit. Maybe a prime closed orbit of <coughs> least period. So it's just a closed orbit for the flow, and it's the time it takes to come back to a given point. But I'm only interested in going around once, not repeating the orbit, so that's the reference to prime orbit. So it's a complex function, and the reason I like to write it like this was because of a similarity to the definition of the, of the Riemann zeta function. And so that's the formulation here. And in the same way that for the uh, artin mesa zeta function, you could easily say stuff um, about its um, <coughs> domain of convergence, we can do exactly the same here. It converges in some region, otherwise it wouldn't be a very useful definition. <coughs> And then you can also say something about its extension to a larger domain. <coughs> and these facts are kind of well known. There's good reason to state them. And so for an oscillator flows, not just for geodesic flows, we know uh, the following. First of all, um, uh, zeta, well, S. 
I think you've abbreviated it to zeta rho, but somehow rho sounded like a bad thing to write. So this is going to be uh, as defined above, and it converges <coughs> to a, a non zero analytic function um, for. Well, it's in a half plane, so it's to the real part of S bigger than something. And in this case, it's going to be the entropy of the flow, which means the entropy of the final <coughs> flow. So if I were to draw a picture, it converges on some half plane over here. Here's zero, here is H5, so it converges. Uh, and it also has an extension to a bigger half plane, where in fact to the entire complex plane. And so it extends <coughs> meromorphically. Which means you can have poles as well as zeros uh, to the entire complex plane. Uh, it also has a simple pole at uh, S is equal to H. So these are very uh, well-known sort of results. Um, well, this was uh, proved uh, by uh, Giletti, G, uh, Liverani, <coughs> and myself, and it was also approved by uh, Dyatlov. There's a golden rule in giving talks, which is if you can mention somebody's name in the audience, you should always do that. <clears throat> okay, so this is all about um, well-known settings where we have um, a Nossoff, where we have a Nossoff diffeomorphism, and the, the zeta function exists and has an extension to the entire plane, which for re some reason or other is supposed to be nice. And then for the flow, it's also true. We have a smooth and also flow, and it also has a property that it has an extension to the entire complex plane. So the poles and the zeros and the, the, the values that you get in the extension have some interpretation. But I wasn't planning to talk about that too much. And what I was going to do instead was to move on to a third topic, which is to move beyond geodesic flows to look at a lot of uh, representations. So. <clears throat> A lot of representations uh, are sometimes mentioned. Maybe I shouldn't just rub out a board I've just written. That might be a bad thing to do. Let me go back to comments there. So a lot of representations um, uh, what used to be called um, higher type model theory. Uh, but somehow type model never got a good press. So I thought it was better to drop that. And we're just back to a lot of representations now. And so what they are is... Um, rather akin to this example of the geodesic flow, which I was busily rubbing out, where you have a representation of uh, a subgroup of, of SL2R, SL2R. <coughs> so the third topic is going to be a lot of representations. <clears throat> and these were I'm just promoted by people like uh, Lavery and a whole list of people which I won't write down well, eminent people with names like Scott or Scott um, <clears throat> and so we want to consider more general setting. Then the case I just talked about for geodesic flows, which was PSL 2 r So in particular, I want to consider uh, representations of the fundamental group of whatever my manifold was, uh, usually a surface group, into um, S L. Where P is going to be greater than equal to 3. So this will be it's the fundamental group of the surface. And this will just be some nice, faithful representation into not um, 
PSO2R, not SO2R, but in fact uh, SLDR. And so <coughs> if we have such a representation, then it's called a knot if it has a bunch of properties. So this is uh, the following. So rho would be an Anosov <coughs> uh, representation if it does the following. Uh, if we can find constants uh, C and uh, rho, we feel a bit positive. Uh, with the property that if I choose any element of the group, which I think I'm calling gamma, not G, if I choose anything in the uh, fundamental group, except possibly the identity, and then I look at um, the image under the representation, so it will give me a matrix in SLDR, and so I look at the eigenvalues of that matrix, which I will denote by <coughs> lambda i, uh, of the image rho of gamma, so this is a matrix in uh, S D R, and hopefully this will have something like D uh, eigenvalues. And what I need, uh, so let me just say, for rho of gamma in S L D R. What I need is if I have a bunch of properties. Uh, so first of all, I need that it has the biggest eigenvalues. So I'll take it to be lambda one. So this will be lambda rho, and this will be bigger in uh, value. In fact, strictly bigger than the absolute value of the next guy. Uh, so this will be rho of gamma two greater than or equal to down to the last guy, which is going to be. I guess, uh, absolute value, lambda d rho of gamma. So it's just the eigenvalues of this matrix, ordered in some way. <coughs> One of them will be kind of biggest, which I guess is going to mean it's a kind of proximal, proximal property. And I also need that, as I look at more and more elements of the, of the group, then these things kind of grow and the distance between them sort of grows as well. Or I'll to write that in a slightly mathematical way. The second property would be the following. <coughs> Almost done. Uh, and the second property is that if I look at the ratio of any two of these guys, so let's say at lambda k of uh, rho of gamma, that's the uh, k eigenvalue for some particular matrix coming from this representation. If I compare it with the next guy one, that's the rho of gamma, and that's the absolute value, and presumably k here is going to be uh, less than g minus 1 or bigger than 1 anything that makes sense, then these numbers come into play, so this grows exponentially like a uh, constant exponential rho times something depending on g, and the something here is just the word length. <coughs> and this is with respect to some uh, symmetric twist generators. the fundamental group. So the word length is just measuring um, how many of the generators are needed to write down a particular element of the group. So if you go out in the group, or whatever going out means, you need more and more generators. And what that means is, in fact, that this ratio has to grow at an exponential rate. So if you were to think back to uh, this case, then this is kind of what you'd expect, uh, because here the matrices are just 2 by 2, despite the fact they're in a slightly different setting. And this is kind of like a general idea. So if we're going to define a, um, a zeta function in this context. Uh, excuse me? Yes. What, 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 G? G? Uh, what is G? G is what we have. Yeah, there's some interchangeability here. <laughs> Let me write over here. G is equal to gamma. <laughs> 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 Let me write even more. It's got three bars. Mu is equal to 
Music or the road? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> Okay. Isn't Rose the name of the representation? Damn, you're right. <laughs> I love Rose the <laughs> ah. Okay, so um, if you want to define a zeta function, uh, we've now got, uh, we'd, we'd like to take some numbers out of this representation, which will play the role of the lengths of the closed geodesics in the previous case. So in that case, they were related to the entries in the matrix, and it's the same sort of thing here. So what I'll do is uh, I'll denote some sort of uh, analog of length, which I'll denote by d for some different sort of reason, and on the representation, and for an element gamma in the group, it's going to be simply the log of the, uh, the um, maximal eigenvalue, which is growing kind of exponentially anyway. So it's meant to be a kind of generalization of what happens to fixing groups. And then now I've got a countable set of values because this is for every gamma in pi one n minus uh, e. If e was going to be the identity. Maybe I should be right, e is equal to i just in case. And then uh, the definition of the zeta function. So this will be a, a zeta function uh, for my representation, my not of representation with these properties, um, well, it's going to depend on a complex variable, which is S, and it's going to look uh, a bit like uh, this guy down here, which was the uh, UL guy. So what we're going to do is simply say that it's going to be... I'm in the context I am. And then what I'll do is I'll take a product over something, which will be essentially uh, these elements gamma, almost, in fact, no mystery. So here, <coughs> this is the uh, community class of uh, gamma. And then what I do is I write 1 minus e to the minus s, and then instead of the length, I put in this particular guy. So that would be d gamma, uh, no, d rho of gamma like that, and probably the minus one. <clears throat> so in my youth, when I finished my PhD, I spent um, six months, maybe it was eight months, at IHS, uh, chatting to people like Ruel. And um, one thing is that it didn't improve my French at all. Uh, but also, uh, another thing is that Ruel told me the only thing, you, well, the most useful thing I learned, not the only useful The most useful thing I learned at IHS was that when you write down these zeta functions, you should always put three minus on one, two, three. It took you six months to teach me that. But there were three minus signs. One fact, but there were three minus signs in this definition. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> naive question Where do you take lambda one? Huh? Where do you take lambda one? Because in this case, you have many choices, like lambda one over lambda two. Yeah, there are lots of choices, yes. Uh, What's special about the more lambda one? The top one. I mean, why, why lambda one and not the other guys? Uh, because it's easier to prove things about the zeta function. Um, you, you can also, it's, it's actually slightly more sensible um, not to look at just lambda 1, but to take away the, the least eigenvalue as well. Um, but that just gets more complicated. I'm, I'm, I'm a guy who likes simple things. And, uh, this is only prime guy or uh, primitive guys or not? Uh, sorry, yes. Yeah, so it's also good. Everything is primitive. Particularly my lecture is well. Basically, what it is, <clears throat> and um, lots of references here. I'm not quite sure what they're for, but never mind. Anyway, the idea is that this is meant to be uh, like it's meant to be like an analog of what I've just written on the other one, particularly in the context of, of just geodesic codes. You should carefully ignore the fact that the P has disappeared in PSL two R. <clears throat> um, where, where did these examples? Or let me, let me state a theorem. That would be useful. So I, I said that in the case of uh, the uh, altin mazur zeta function, there was a meromorphic extension to the entire plane, kind of easy, as a rational function. And in the case of the Anosov, uh, <coughs> case of the Anosov uh, flows, the corresponding zeta function had an extension to the entire complex plane as well. So you might expect that the same statement is going to appear here, and that is indeed the case. So here is a theorem. 
<coughs> and this is uh, myself and uh, and it says that the zeta function here zeta lower s uh, has well, I should actually say where it converges that might be intelligent so if it converges on a half plane the real part of s greater than something which I'll call h subscript rho and I'll assume that h, sub, uh, h of rho is chosen to be um, the, the largest value for which this is true so it's converging again on some half plane like this so this is uh, zeta rho of s converges to a function so this one here corresponds to the value h of rho, which I'm defining just to be the best I can manage to get the whole plane of <coughs> See, I'm sizing. And, and so... Is there a simple pole? Yeah, it's going to be in the statement, don't worry. As ever, Keith shows great insight. And, uh, <coughs> anticipation. Uh, so this has a variable extension. Extension uh, to the entire complex plane. That will simply hold So, where do these examples come from? So, these are also representations. Um, well, let me briefly say something about examples. And they're associated normally to something called the Hitching component. <coughs> Named after Nigel Hitching, who was my colleague at Warwick for about three years, or possibly just two years. He used to be in uh, Oxford when he came to Warwick and when he was to Cambridge. Like a transit point or something. Um, and so the idea here is that, uh, let's say that we're given a uh, representation for a fixing group. So, um, oh, it's an interesting notation. Uh, let's say it's uh, pi 1 of m mapping into uh, PSL2R. PSL2R, so these are kind of familiar. <coughs> right, so it's just a fixing group, the image. Um, we can associate uh, and associate what's called a, a Fuchsian representation and this I'll denote by rho subscript d. What is it? Um, it's going to be a map of the same. Oops the same fundamental group, but this time around it's going to be into uh, S, L, I want the P? Yes, I do. I do. P, S, L, D, R. So given a normal sort of Fuchsian group, find your R for representation into one of these other groups, and the way you do that is just by, just by composing a couple of guys, and I think I like the following way, so uh, rho of d for new guy is going to be the representation we first thought of into PSL2R uh, composed something else, to two, and it's going to be composed a map I'll call tau for no particular reason. And here uh, tau is just going to be some uh, standard uh, embedding of PSL2R into uh, PSL uh, <coughs> 3, no, D, okay, D O R. So you just compose um, one of the guys we've already looked at in the context of um, geodesic flows, just the Fuchsian group, the representation of the fundamental group. And then we compose it with some way to get from this group to that group, and it will give us a representation into PSL D R. And this uh, map uh, tau is just going to be a standard uh, um, <coughs> representation. 
the easiest one is if you take b to be equal to 3, and then tau of the matrix A, B, C, D, if we take the plus or minus 1, uh, will just be a 3 by 3 matrix whose entries are A squared, uh, 2AB, uh, B squared, and then AC, uh, BC plus uh, AB, uh, and then whatever the same C squared, uh, 2CD, and a D squared. And these just come from looking at uh, homogeneous polynomials. But this is the simplest one. I like simplicity, and so that's what it is. So if you take your favorite uh, Fuchs cube group, just given by uh, representation of the fundamental group into uh, two by two uh, matrices, then you can conjure up uh, lots of these uh, so called Fuchsian representations of uh, this particular uh, property. And isn't it just the irreducible representation of. Uh, Sorry? Isn't it just the irreducible representation of PSL2 or in. I'm just being specific. Okay. okay. And then the hitching component makes a brief appearance at the stage. So now I've now got uh, an irreducible representation into uh, PSL3 uh, D, or more, or PSL3 R, or more generally D times R. And <coughs> what I want to do now is to look at more of these guys. And so, finally, the appearance of May, this is the kitchen component. And it's just the uh, connected component uh, in the representations of this particular So they have the above property, and the zeta function has an extension to have the entire complex plane. So looking at my notes, I have, I would say, in, in the tolerance of the audience, uh, about um, five minutes, and I have two seconds. So let me briefly uh, compose. Uh, few comments about the proof. So ingredients in proof. Proof of what? Are uh, the proof of the uh, result about the zeta functions at the top of the board. And uh, so the ingredients are basically uh, used ideas for the old article. paper. which is the loss of uh, flows. Uh, but then uh, we also need to use um, some sort of coding. So why am I always talking about surface groups? It's because I want to use uh, a coding for <coughs> I1 and N, which is due to uh, either a Cameron series or possibly uh, Cameron or some combination you would use work. And so using this machinery, mixed together in a judicious fashion, then you can prove something or other. Okay, so let me finish off um, by just saying a few words about why one might conceivably be interested in extensions of zeta functions. There's some reason for it. There's a lot of people in business for many years. <coughs> so let me just mention at least one application, possibly two. So, here we go. So, uh, oh, it's the application. So, I'll talk again about the context of um, these Anosov representations rather than general results about Anosov uh, diffeomorphisms or Anosov flows. 
And so um, the, the uh, usual application for uh, zebra functions is to count things. So this is about asymptotic counting. And so we want to use the results from the zebra function to say something about counting something. So what we have is for every element of the, of the fundamental group, of which are accountably many, we have associated these weights, which I call d rho of uh, the element of the group, which itself is really just related to the maximal eigenvalue of the matrix. And so uh, we can define the following. We can define uh, a counting function. So we can define, let's say, d rho of t. So rho is my Anosov uh, representation. C is just going to be some number that's going to go to infinity. And this is going to be the number of community classes of uh, primitive uh, elements uh, with the property uh, that is associated with weight, uh, which is what gamma, is going to be less than t. So in the case of the uh, geodesic flow, we are counting the uh, number of closed um, orbits or closed geodesics whose length was less than t. But here we're looking at something which is kind of in a, in a bigger space, and so we're associating to it these numbers itself. And so uh, what we'd like to say is the following. Well, um, there exists some value epsilon greater than zero, uh, with the property that this is true, so uh, let me say, uh, let me restrict to the case that d is equal to 3 for the moment. So in this case, um, if, I, if I have my counting function, I'd like to say that it grows uh, exponentially at some rate. So as t increases, it increases monotonically. And the question is, how does it tend to infinity? Well, the answer is, it, it tends to like some standard function. So the uh, logarithmic integral function, so this will be e to the h rho times t. And then there'll be some error term, which would be 1 plus order e to the minus uh, epsilon of t. So it's a fairly precise thing. And this rather mysterious object, whatever else it is, is just asymptotic to um, e to the h rho t over h of rho times t. As t tends to infinity. And so in the case of um, um, d is equal to 2, this would correspond to the formula for counting closed uh, geodesics. In the great tradition of Selberg and Margulis and these guys. You should always end on two fields medalists, so I'll stop there. For Mark? Uh, so, I have one question. So, uh, in your results, uh, so this is for pi 1m, so for yeah. fundamental group. Yeah. But I think the definition goes with uh, more general. Yeah. So, what, what kind of property is necessary for the result to hold? Uh, well, if you have a word hyperbolic group, you're probably in good shape. Um, I, I, I formulated it for a surface group system because it's easy to make the connection with, with the geodesic flows from before. But most of the machinery, the, the ideas that are used to construct the meromorphic, the meromorphic extension is just old fashioned symbolic dynamics transfer operator stuff. So it doesn't see any of the geometry. So, in fact, I think it works quite generally. So, for example, for the word hyperbolic groups, you can check that. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, there's another question. So, for uh, your application, you need uh, to estimate some, some, in some way the zeros of your uh, zeta function. That's correct. And how do you go about doing uh, that? We, we, we use we use over here. Okay. That, that's why we don't have the epsilon. Ah, there's some epsilon. And it's also the reason that I made this restriction that d is equal to uh, to, to, to 
to, to, well, to, to three of that where it should have ended up up here, because otherwise it gets a bit more complicated. So I, I fail to see um, right away what's the relation between the function you defined and the L function which we used, uh, mm -hmm. which we saw back in the days, which still takes the fundamental group and embeds into a zero function. Is there a way to... Well, you, you can also associate it with an L function. So the L function is normally right. representations into unitary groups. Whereas here I'm taking a representation into SLD, DR, which is somewhat different. Uh, so here we could also do both. We could take, um, in fact, that, that was the, the second application of the index. Uh, you can take a representation uh, of uh, every element of your fundamental group into sort of unitary group. Circle's always a good choice. Um, and it's just a character. And then you can define a zeta function, but in the definition of a zeta function, um, instead of just taking a product involving these weights, you also put a twist in according to the character. And then that zeta fun or that L function has an extension to the entire plane as well. Um, giving you another object to play with, but this one. In the Selberg, in the SL2 case, uh, the, the, the poles uh, that are related to the value of Laplacian, do you know here uh, what you would expect to be the, like the poles of uh, this function? Um, do I know what I would expect? I have no idea, actually. Um, so, so as I said at the beginning, um, my anecdote about changing money, uh, as I'm using very old techniques, and these techniques are blind to uh, interpretations of, of poles. So all I know is that there is an extension, and this extension, you, you could probably characterize the poles in terms of things that you don't want to characterize it in terms of eigenvalues of some, some operator, which is kind of ad hoc constructed. So it doesn't have a natural interpretation. And you don't expect the uh, zeros to be uh, on, a, on some lines like that? I, I would not expect that. But then, what do I know? Hey. <laughs> So, like there are def uh, diff different definitions of another representation. So, where do you, where do you use that? Like, uh, you require like there's a gap in between every like lambda k and lambda k plus one. So I think there is a notion of dominate. Uh, you just there is a definition of another representation. You just require uh, the lambda one over lambda two is have this group. Yeah. So yeah. I mean there. I think taking shortcuts here. So what I've defined is something called one and Yeah, yeah. There's also something called P and yeah, yeah. Um so, so in the original definition of an Ossoff representations, it had lots of stuff about maps to the boundary. And in fact, that's what we're using. So all, all, all I've done here is to formulate a definition of uh, an Ossoff representation, which is equivalent, or at least implies another definition which I'm using. Uh, could, I, could I get away with less? Very probably. It didn't occur to me to try that. <coughs> uh, there's another question here, please. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, what is the, uh, or is there a geometric interpretation of your H row? I mean, you say in D equal 2, there is a geometric interpretation, it's a closed geodesics. How is it, how is it here, yeah? I mean, um, does it have uh, Okay, so it, it itself, um, I'm not sure what the interpretation is. Um, again, it comes out of the machinery that there's a pole there. Um, people smarter than me, which there are many, um, who work on things related to um, the, the Anosov representations and, and um, this higher type of theory, people like Dick Canary and these guys, uh, they are interested in, in how this, um, this, uh, this function varies as row changes. As row changes, the representation gets wobbled around then what happens is that the H changes in a nice smooth way. And they have a characterization of the second derivative of that, giving you a notion of a they peterson type metric, which is kind of borrowed, well, borrowed, no. It's, I was going to say mimicking, it's getting worse. Um, inspired by uh, an interpretation by Kurt McMullen of the they peterson metric, blah, 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 which I don't really understand. But anyway, so the, the answer to your question is I don't really know the significance beyond this counting argument. But its derivative seems to have some geometric significance. Is, is there some relation? I mean, in this Anosov representation, they also come always with a metric Anosov flow. Yeah? 
Yeah. Is there any relation of the theta function that you study with this uh, metric flow? It, it could be. So, so when you cook up the, the, the flow, I mean, normally what you have to do is to do, you take two copies of the boundary, and well, morally, and then construct the flow from that. I, I usually try to avoid that because it seems a little artificial in this particular context, but I should imagine it well, could well be the, the topological entropy for such an entity. I would guess, but I, I'm not sure. <clears throat> and if you if you have this, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. If you have this representation, I mean, uh, you also have a flight connection and so on. Do you have uh, some uh, relation with that? Could you twist like some another system on the base with a flight connection and get some similar objects related to what you're studying? I'm sure you could. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you could. I haven't I haven't thought about that. Okay, there are no more questions. Thank you very much, Mark.